So good afternoon. Welcome to the 28th Military Rider Symposium. And we are extremely glad that you're here in person and also for those of you that are watching online, wherever you may be, we are extremely proud of you uh, joining us today. So this is the last official event for our, our two-day session. And I must say that uh, this year has been in incredibly powerful from multiple different dimensions from talking about artificial intelligence and it's the nexus between robots to the Kobe Award presentation, um, interacting with a student of Norwich and also a faculty member. Um, it's just been an incredible time. And uh, the great aspect of this and technology is not only have we been able to broadcast this out live, but we're able to record it and to use it um, later on. So one of the unique at attributes of the Military Writers Symposium is the focus on student research. And you're gonna hear from three of our student researchers here in a little bit. But before we do that, one of the things that we've discussed over the course of these past two days is just the importance of uh, cultural intelligence and also just the importance of recognizing that when we talk about anything as it relates to artificial intelligence and robotics, that it's not a English-centric conversation. We're talking about a subject in which certain nation states are leading the narrative, and we're also talking about a subject in which other nation states will receive the outcome of the narrative. And so one of the ways in which we want to internationalize our time together is just to give a couple of minutes to student voices some of them in English and some of them in their, their native dialect. And so, Drakshan, if you could come forward. We're gonna ask uh, Drakshan to share just a little bit about uh, her thoughts on the Military Writers Symposium and the intersection of uh, our topic and then also just how it relates to her time here at Norwich. And we've asked her to do that a little bit in her native tongue and then some in, in English. And then we're gonna turn that over to the panel. But without further ado, Drakshan. You have the podium. Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Durkshan Farhad, senior English major at Norwich University, also second lieutenant for international section in the Corps of Cadets. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of merciful and kind God is what we say in the beginning of every speech when we present back in Afghanistan. Something that for years I have not done, but today it felt like the right thing to do. And you will know later why. I was asked to present on this day weeks ago. I kept thinking of different topics that I could reflect on as part of my speech. I also came up with a script, none of them, none of those scripts provided a convincing enough idea to, to contribute to the dialogue in the manner I wanted them to. Yesterday, after attending several sessions and panels for the symposium, I noticed different aspects about artificial intelligence and a rise of robotics. I heard about the future of robotics and the challenges of implement, implementing these robotics in different environments. And most, and for, and mostly important, one of the quotations or phrases that I heard over and over again, that something that was uh, science fiction is now a reality or the future. And most of the countries, the name of the countries that I heard the most were the United States, China, Russia, names that entertain the privilege of creating weapons of mass destruction and fulfill their ambitions at the expense of third world countries where these weapons are mostly used. And it is a very pressing matter because I grew up in Afghanistan and I know the effects of these weaponries and what they do to humankind. One of the questions I asked yesterday during one of the sessions was how the countries who are mostly affected by AI have a say into all the decision-making processes that go into creating these elements. 
The short response was, honestly, they're not even at the table. And their perspective is most of the time is missing. And it was very obvious because uh, questions like, okay, these um, weapons are created, but what do we know about the fact that there are ethical concerns about using them? What are the grounds in which uh, they should be used in third world countries, in countries like Afghanistan? Are they going to be intelligent enough to be able to make decisions based on human intelligence and emotional intelligence to, to be able to tell who is the enemy? And the good thing is that this symposium and this institution has entertained the idea of starting a dialogue, a dialogue in which we need to ask these questions because this is a matter that is globally entertained and it's globally affecting the countries that are not necessarily part of this process of creating such a thing. So if you are here to learn something, one of the things you need to learn is to be able to ask those questions and say, how are, how, what is the scope of how these elements can affect other countries? Which countries would be affected the most? And what is the level of destruction? And is it needed? So today, as one person, as someone who has this podium and who has this chance to be able to speak on behalf of so many Afghans who, are, who might not be able to get this chance ever, I want to say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of merciful and kind God, to start a dialogue, to start heading to a direction where we see this as a global matter and not just something limited to a symposium or just United States. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Sean. So as you've deducted over the past couple of days, one of the things that we emphasize at the symposium is bringing in subject matter experts who could advance our understanding on the theme at hand. We are interested in student engagement from last night from at least the 40 some students that lined up to ask questions to the other students over the past couple days that have engaged with our, our authors formally through questions, but also out in Mac and around campus. But something that you may not know is that there are students that are awarded fellowships to conduct research over the theme each year. And one of those is endowed, it's called the Schultz Fellowship, and that is given from the Schultz family from class of 1960, who was part of the symposium and has started I'm supporting it from the onset. The family is endowed a fellowship, which we can gratefully say that it's grown to the degree where this year we're able to fund two Schultz Fellows. And then the other is a Peace and War Research Fellow. And these students conduct research, funded research over the course of the summer. They are given really an, an open dossier of how they want to proceed. They could travel overseas, they could build something, they could paint something, they can write about something, they can do interviews, really, or they can engineer something, some sort of product. The, the point here is that the Military Writer Symposium is something that's interdisciplinary and we want students from multiple different disciplines to be involved, to do research, but also we wanna give them a platform and that's what we're doing today. So it is my privilege and, and honor to introduce one of my colleagues, Dr. Steve Sodergren, who is also the only Kobe Award winner from Norwich University. He's a Civil War historian, and he's also the chair of the Department of History and Political Science. It's my honor and privilege to turn the podium over to him as he takes care of the panel and introduces our student research fellows. So Dr. Sogren, it's yours. Thank you very much, Professor Morris. Um, podiums aren't built for people of my height, so forgive me if I stoop. Um, <laughs> It is my pleasure to stand before you uh, today to introduce these outstanding Norwich students at what is the final panel, uh, the final discussion related to this year's Colby, this year's Norwich Symposium, which has been, I think, a tremendous success. And throughout the past two days, we have been talking about the future, the future, the future. Forgive the praise, but this is the future. These are the students who are going to be shaping uh, not just the technologies at our disposal, but the manners in which we use them. 
So these are the voices that we need to be hearing right now, and it is my pleasure to introduce them. And I just, once again, like many others, I wanna thank Professor Morris, I wanna thank Megan Liptak, I wanna thank Yang Moku, I wanna thank all of those who helped make this year's symposium such a wonderful success. What we'll do is I'm going to read off the biographies of all the student presenters, and then we're just going to do one presentation after another and save time at the end for questions that I will moderate. But from left to right here, the, uh, you see our three students. The first one to my left is Elena Latino, who is one of the recipients of the 2022 Richard S. Schultz Class of 1960s Symposium Fellowships. Elena is from Atkinson, New Hampshire. She is currently a junior at Norwich University studying computer safety and information assurance with a concentration in digital forensics. Although relatively new to the field, her summer research presentation on AI forensics has helped her engage with experts in both artificial intelligence and digital forensics. This opened new doors for her and sparked an interest in her future. Over the summer, Elena had the chance to study abroad through Norwich's Maymester, the immersive class on cyber surveillance allowed her to explore new areas of computer safety in Germany. Elena has a passion for digital forensics, but on the side, she also enjoys surfing when she is home for the summer, as well as playing club field hockey while at school. To Elena's left is the other recipient of this year's Richard S. Schultz Class of 1960 Symposium Fellowship, Gabriel Williams. Gabriel is a Norwich senior from Suffolk, Virginia. He attended Hampton Roads Academy where he was captain of the track and field. Discovering early on that he thoroughly enjoyed the field of government and politics, Gabriel chose to attend Norwich University as a political science major, planning to work in the government sector or intelligence community upon graduation. At Norwich, Gabriel co-founded the Norwich University boxing program and made history this past year as he was part of the first Norwich boxing team to ever compete in the National Collegiate Boxing Association. As a member of the Corps of Cadets, Gabriel thoroughly enjoys working with the Rook class as he was cadre staff in his junior year and is an officer in cadet training company this year. Outside of, Norwich, outside of Norwich, Gabriel has had internship and contracting experiences in the Department of State and the Department of Defense. Finally, to my far left is the recipient of the 2022 Military Writers Symposium Research Fellowship, Wesley Dewey. Wesley is a student at Norwich, class of 2023. He believes in personal and professional growth, hard work, and furthering the great legacy that Norwich University holds. Wesley is studying for his Bachelor of Science in Marketing Management. He has also spent time playing for the Norwich University eSports program and spends time outside of class with friends and family or in the gym. Uh, just before we begin, a round of applause for these wonderful scholars. We cannot te heap too much praise upon them, but to begin with, I'd like to hand over the podium to our first speaker of the afternoon, Elena Latino. There we go. Hello, as you just heard, my name is Elena Latino and I'm a junior here at Norwich University. So I can skip the intro that you just heard. Over the summer, I did research on the current uses of artificial intelligence and how and why there's a need for the subfield of AI forensics, specifically in warfare. So my real conclusion to this research was because of the rapid and widespread adoption of various AI embedded systems and their complexities, it is now necessary for the need of forensics expertise and forensics tools for commercial and military applications. To understand this, I interviewed many different experts from professors here at Norwich to professors at different universities, as well as workers in private sector and for the government. 
I read and reviewed many different peer-reviewed sources as well as books. I attended two AI conferences. I watched many informational videos and listened to podcasts. And through all this, I was able to form my opinion, which I will share today. So to get started, I would like to explain the field of digital forensics itself. So as my digital forensics teacher, Professor Adkins explains, digital forensics is the intersection of criminology, computer science, and law. The field of digital forensics came about when computer-related incidents began to occur. These incidents brought about the need for scientific and legally acceptable findings, which I'll talk more about in a minute. With the field, it became apparent that different technological incidents required different tools. Um, even, for example, network forensics and email forensics, although at some point may overlap, their differences require different solutions. The same will go for the new fields of AI forensics. As I mentioned before, these findings must be legally acceptable. According to the United States Federal Rule of Evidence for scientific evidence, to be used in court and must meet certain tests. These tests come about with the Daubert standard, as you can see here. They need to be tested with known potential errors and subject to peer review or publication. So now with the understanding of digital forensics, we can move on and discuss artificial intelligence. In simple terms, artificial intelligence leverages computers and machines to mimic problem-solving and decision-making capabilities of the human mind. However, as you might have learned from attending a conference over the past two days, the field of artificial intelligence is in no way simple. AI consists of different layers, as shown, such as machine learning, deep learning, and many more complex integrations of these methods. Although AI might be complex, there are very many common uses you might be familiar with. Virtual assistants on your phone, such as Siri or Google Assistant, utilize machine learning algorithms to gather the information you requested. Ads and recommendations on streaming platforms might seem targeted towards you. Well, that's because they are. Through deep learning algorithms, content can be personalized. Facial recognition, surveillance, and self-driving vehicles are widely popular in both commercial and military, in the military world. Think about the car you drive. How many of your vehicles with, have lane assistance features or automatic braking? All right, so a few. Well, according, or you can thank, sorry, you can thank artificial intelligence for these features. How about a, fl a plane that you've flown on recently? Has anyone flown on a plane recently? Well, according to an expert I spoke with, Dr. Haig, humans are only responsible to approximately three to 10 minutes of this flight. Everything else is done by AI. So next time you take a flight, you might want to think about the fact that the pilot really isn't doing much. The use of AI in warfare is very expansive. Just as I mentioned before, it is used in unmanned, aerial, or unmanned vehicles, including aerial, ground, and water vehicles. UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles specifically, are being used in about half, over 90, of the militaries around the world. Specifically in that group, 16 of those countries have armed drones. Surveillance, navigation, smart munitions, and cyber attacks are a few more areas where AI is being used. Many of these advancements are helping to imp make improvements with the efficiency and safety in war. However, no system is 100% effective. Everything is prone to failures. And this brings me to my next point, AI issues. Data poisoning, adversarial attacks, deception, complex environments, and unexplainable decisions are just some of the issues that have arose, that have and will arise due to the use of artificial intelligence. One issue I believe to be highly concerning was unexplainable decisions. As you can see from the graphic, today AI is not explainable. Many decisions made do not have an understandable reasoning. However, the goal is to get to the point where these algorithms are explainable. And however, from the experts I heard from, it might be quite, impo possible, quite impossible to get to this task. My paper goes more into depth on this part of research. 
Another issue could be complex environments. For example, in 2019, a driver of a Tesla Model 3 turned on autopilot. 10 seconds later, the vehicle drove into a semi-truck that crossed in front of it, killing the driver. Um, and this is just one of several scenarios of this happening. And then, although we try to test for every scenario, for example, a semi-truck crossing in front of a driver, it, mistakes can still be made. So although this happened in the commercial wor world, issues like this can and will happen in war as well. And with that, I come to conclude that AI is in heavy use in both civilian and military sectors in all different parts. AI-enabled systems can be attacked, they can be confused, and they can also be inadequate, inadequately trained. So when failures occur in these systems, forensics evaluations will be needed. Just like any other digital forensics field, these evaluations will be dependent on tested theories and methods. But where we are today, we are lacking the forensic specialists and the forensic tools that are needed to help this field grow. So, although there may be a lack of AI forensics ex experts today, I hope to have sparked an interest in even one person to want to become an AI forensics expert for tomorrow. Thank you. Excellent work. Let me step in here and set up our next slide presentation and introduce Gabriel Williams for his presentation. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's here in the auditorium today. It's a pleasure to be here speaking with you. Um, moving forward, uh, Project today is going to be artificial intelligence and the electromagnetic spectrum, right? Uh, specifically focusing on electromagnetic warfare, right? And how the intersection of the two are creating some new capabilities on the field of battle, right? And why there's a need to educate the warfighter on those, right? Um, so first and foremost, let's have a conversation about, um, you know, what is the electromagnetic spectrum? Many people don't know. Many people confuse the electromagnetic spectrum with cyberspace. Uh, and to be quite frank, the the definition is very simple. The electromagnetic spectrum is a series of frequencies that vary in wavelength, right? Uh, within that, you have the radio spectrum, which is what we're talking about right now, speakers, microphones, this right here. Um, you have microwaves, which are more complex components that house data links, right? The transition between aircraft, tanks, um, ships, missile systems, right? You have visible light as well, and you have gamma rays and x-rays, right? Um, so everyone, in the room and everyone in the military environment is also affected by the electromagnetic spectrum. For instance, who has a cell phone? Raise your hand. Okay. 4G, 5G, 6G, all spectrum. Who has talked on the radio before? Raise your hand. A few people? Spectrum operations. Who has flown an airplane in some regard? Raise your hand. There's a hint of spectrum operations within that, right? So it's important to understand that the electromagnetic spectrum has a um, key impact on not just civilian life, but also military life and military operations as well, right? Within the military, right, the electromagnetic spectrum is utilized in uh, more or less three core uh, environments, right? So the first one we talk about is characterization, right? So when we discuss the operational environment, right, the field of battle between ourselves and the adversary, um, the, one of the first important things we have to do is characterize and understand what that battlefield looks like, right? Uh, whether that be different enemy units on the ground, uh, tanks, missile systems, weapon systems, whatever they are, we have to identify them and identify their capabilities and how they uh, compare with us, compare and contrast. So one of those core concepts is co command, control, computers, C4 ISR, right? Uh, these are some of the systems and capabilities that the uh, United States military and our near peer and Unfortunately, in one day, maybe pure adversaries used to characterize and understand uh, the battlefield in which our warfighters operate in. And the electromagnetic spectrum uh, underlays within all of that. Uh, another subset is more focused on direct action, right? So jamming, 
jamming radio frequencies, jamming communications between soldiers on the ground, jamming communications between satellites and soldiers on the ground, jamming communications between two different naval vessels, right? These are what we call direct actions. And then within that, we have destruction, using high-powered laser beams to destroy communication centers and arrays or other critical infrastructure needs to the military apparatus. These things are very key and important, right? Things that we have to be cognizant about as war fighters and as people that support the war fighting operation. And then the third one is deception, right? So reducing the, front, the electromagnetic footprint that um, friendly forces have in the battlefield, right? A key example of this would be stealth technology in the United States Air Force, right? Reducing the footprint of a B-2 bomber or F-22 on a radar system. That's all emphasized and all depends on the electromagnetic spectrum to actually achieve that goal, right? Uh, these are things that are often forgotten about. Moving forward, right, to complete some of those utilization tasks, uh, the, the DOD and, and our NATO, NATO partners, we really focus on electromagnetic warfare, right? This is kind of the core concept that the Department of Defense focuses on to achieve some of those core utilization tasks, right? And electromagnetic warfare is comprised of three different subsects. You have electromagnetic attack, electromagnetic protect, and electromagnetic support. Each of them map directly to those core concepts, right? Deception is all about protection, protecting our systems, protecting our planes, war fighters, what have you, from enemy surveillance and detection, right? Uh, attack, direct energy attacks on enemy systems, right? Deny and degrade their ability to access the spectrum, right? And how they can use that to eliminate our capability to operate. And then electromagnetic support is all about, again, sensing and characterizing the environment, understanding the battlefield in which our warfighters exist in, complement signals intelligence at a very high rate. Now, I gather within the first five to seven minutes, you know, many of you may be asking, this is an artificial intelligence conference, and I'm speaking about spectrum operations and electromagnetic warfare, which, you know, many people may not see the overlay. But as we move forward uh, into an age that, you know, where there are more sophisticated technologies and more sophisticated threats to our nation, we have to begin to think at an interdisciplinary level. We have to understand where there can be overlap to meet the needs that the nation has and fight the threats that are here and now and that will be in the future. And that comes to this intersection, right, the overlap, right, let me see if this, there we go, the overlap, right. And oftentimes in AI circles, right, we talk about artificial intelligence, this, the ODA loop gets thrown around, which is observe, orient, decide, act, right. Kind of the framework in which um, members of the artificial intelligence community build cognitive systems from a deep learning or machine learning perspective, right. Um, within the ODA loop, it maps directly to a correlation with electromagnetic warfare, right. Observing is all about electromagnetic support, orientation, it's all about electromagnetic support. Again, deciding, it's all about electromagnetic support. Understanding, characterizing the environment that our warfighters exist in, right? And then acting, making that decision is, comes with action, electromagnetic attack. What do we have to do? What are our options, right? So these are things that there is an overlap in. And uh, in my experiences working in the DOD and working in the Department of State, I've been to many AI oriented conference. I've worked at the JAX Center, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, for a couple of rotations. And, and these are the conversations that our key leaders are having. Uh, it's about building interdisciplinary solutions to complex problems in the modern age. So these, these, these are some of the conversations that our leaders are having. It's very important. Um, for me, right, my contribution to this conversation, this topic, which is important, right, is thinking about how do I distill that concept of how do we protect the warfighter, or how do we protect our, our, our civilians, how do we distill that concept down to undergraduate academia level, right? So the, the focal point of my research was to conduct the study uh, in an informational manner, understand these two topics, how they correlate, and then build out a pathway to bridge this concept to academia. And that's where my certificate pilot program comes into play. I've been in coordination with the DOD and, and NATO forces for the last five months about building a certificate program that would enable uh, students at the undergraduate level to take courses and understand electromagnetic spectrum and how it impacts uh, their particular career field, whether it be in cyber or electrical engineering or spectrum management, anything in science technology or in ROTC. So these are concepts that I've been working with the DOD for a certain amount of time and we've made excellent progress and this is my contribution to, to that point 
bringing awareness of the spectrum and how it coordinates with artificial intelligence to change the future that we exist in. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Gabriel. Our last speaker of the afternoon is Wesley Dewey. How's it going, everybody? My name is Wesley, and this summer I focused on studying the weaponization of echo chambers, more specifically uh, the weaponization of echo chambers using artificial intelligence. And so to start things off, I just want to define what an echo, ch echo chamber is. An echo chamber is an environment where a person only encounters opinions or perspectives that align with their own. On social media or online in general, companies use artificial intelligence commonly referred to as the algorithm to market and uh, personalize the online experience for the user, and this results in the creation of these echo chambers. And so if you were to, for example, be searching for a lawnmower online, you would be most likely given ads down the road for other lawn care equipment, um, as well as search results relating to that. And as I said, the benefit to that is that you get more efficient marketing for companies as well as a more personalized experience for the user. However, the downfall, again, is that it increases the creation of echo chambers and increases polarization as a result. Cognitive bias is at the root uh, psychologically as to why echo chambers happen. Um, it's defined as a, a logical natural pattern of thought and response to certain stimuli that would produce illogical findings. And so these are just errors in our brains and they affect everybody since the dawn of time. Confirmation bias, more specifically, is a cognitive bias that really centers in why echo chambers happen. It's our brain's tendency to gravitate towards information or data that supports predetermined ideas and so if you already believe something, you will automatically reject evidence that contradicts your belief. So if you ever hear something that goes totally against your beliefs, you feel that little emotional bit of anger, that, that's where that comes from. So echo chambers have already had a pretty major impact on the world, uh, more specifically intentional echo chambers as a result of using artificial intelligence to create them. Um, the Four examples that I focused on in my research are the Capitol riots of 2020, uh, the Syrian White Hats, the Philippines election, and the terrorist organization ISIS. And in all of these examples, the algorithm was used to create echo chambers to manipulate groups of people either into inciting violence or into electing corrupt politicians, um, et cetera. And so with these echo chambers um, on, online, we've also seen a great increase in polarization within politics. And so I st uh, followed a study that looked at Facebook, Twitter, Gab, and Reddit, which are all social platforms. And what was found was that with Facebook and Twitter, there was an increased amount of polarity wherever there was a greater um, amount of echo chambers, and with Gab and Reddit, as the amount of echo chambers increased, they each individually went on their own way, so Gab became more radically right-wing, while Reddit became more radically left-wing. And so what this study did was it compared polarity between the left and right wings with the presence of echo chambers, and what it found was that users online tend to prefer information adhering to their worldviews, ignoring dissenting information, and form polarized groups around shared narratives. Oh, whoops. One second. All right, and so, yeah. So in conclusion, uh, people don't recognize when they're caught in echo chambers because they feel liberated online. And so kind of the big difference between um, echo chambers that occur naturally and echo chambers that occur because of algorithms is that you feel like you're making all of your own decisions when you get caught 
into these echo chambers online. You feel like you're doing all of your own research or you have full control over what you're looking at when in reality there is artificial intelligence behind the scene that's pushing you in one direction or another. And so this is dangerous because there is an unlimited reach through the internet for people to get caught into these echo chambers. It's as if a cult, for example, which is a very historically famous um, and generalized example of echo chambers working in the real world. It's as if a cult could reach out to anybody who is susceptible to their ideas across the world all at once. And the people who are most at risk with these echo chambers uh, as a result of these algorithms are people who are the least skeptical of the information they receive online. And so the, the greatest way to battle this issue is to educate all countries and all students on how to do proper research and educate people to be willing to see both sides of every story or be willing to understand things from multiple perspectives. And lastly, I just want to say thank you to the Peace and War Committee for allowing me to take on this research. I want to thank my mentor, Professor Bosley, for pushing me in this direction. And I want to thank everybody for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you, Wesley. Um, we have about 10 to 15 minutes left. Uh, this is open for questions. So please, I encourage people from the audience, questions about any of the research topics that you've heard before you, the implications of some of what you've heard, please feel free to come down to one of our two microphones at the front here. While, uh, while you think about your questions and move to the front, I will guess I'll start off here and just first of all, congratulations to the panelists. This is all interesting, particularly for an old historian like myself, <laughs> enlightening material. You all called for research. You all called for more education into your fields. Where do you think the impetus for this really has to come from? Are these, you know, I can see both commercial and military applications, just like with AI, for all, each one of your research fields, perhaps more so than others. But where does the, does the push for this have to come out of the private sector? Does it have to come out of the public, uh, public sector? Where do the solutions and the research and the education for this, where does that have to emerge from? I open it up to anybody. Okay, this is on. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a it's an interesting question. Very brilliant. The the concept of you know where does where does the, the advocate where does the advocacy come from for this right? And um, I think it has to be both, if not all. We have to think about it from a holistic approach, right? So it needs to be a, a partnership between private, public, and uh, industry sectors uh, to really push for this, including academia as well, right? Um, we were talking about building an educational framework or advocacy for a certain topic, especially something like AI, which could revolutionize the way, you know, the world operates and the way we as people operate, interact with each other. It's something that has to be a, 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 a multilateral approach or partnership between all different uh, groups to get that done. I think that'd be the best way to, to push for advocacy. And that'd be resources, uh, training, tools, um, monetary needs as well. We have a line of students here, so far be it for me to uh, take up the podium for too long. Please, your first question. So my first question is kind of directed towards William is over here. Um, so you kind of spoke about the electromagnetic spectrum when it comes to AI. So my question is when it comes to risk when introducing AI and technology to the battlefield, do you believe that fratricide is more of uh, going to be more of a prominent risk um, because of hacking and being able to use the electromagnetic spectrum to mess with radio frequencies and waves. And what is a possibility that, like, how can we prevent our AI from being hacked and turned against us if we do introduce it into the battlefield? That's a that's a loaded question. Thank you. Um, I think the, we have to unpack that a little bit, right? So when we talk about integrating. Um, so AI is a broad term, right? Um, and and it, people create many different um, fantasies or concepts when they define AI. You know, there's concepts of human-machine teaming, being, meaning that there's a robot in the 
a robot and a you know infantryman working together on the battlefield, right? Or you know that could just be as simple as saying there is a um, something like a Siri on Alexa platform helping a, a human being understand something. Um, I, I think to prevent the situation which you're talking about, which is an enemy taking advantage of a cognitive system aiding human beings uh, in a battlefield operation, we have to um, first and foremost create AI-enabled cognitive systems that um, are responsible and governable, right? And that we have oversight over and uh, that there is a verification process underlying so that we can verify the decisions that that uh, machine learning algorithm comes to at the end of the day, right? And um, when you think about responsible, ethical, or governable AI, these are kind of the, the, the protocol and policy issues that haven't really been, uh, been worked out yet. So you have a very valid question. I think that has to be the first step, making sure that we create a governable and responsible AI. Um, the second step is um, when you talk about a, a cognitive system in spectrum operations or cognitive VW as it's referred to many times, it, it treads along the subject of human machine teaming being that a that cognitive system isn't taking over uh, the duties that a human operator or a warfighter would do. It's simply supplementing and aiding, right? It's enabling that warfighter to have a greater decision advantage on the battlefield as compared to our adversaries because it's able to perform the same cognitive functions that a human being can, but at a fraction of the time. And when you look at something like the electromagnetic spectrum, one of the slides I had up there, you know, it shows cyberspace as being uh, six components, one of the six bullets up there, but there's a whole vast spectrum out, outside of cyberspace. Um, and that's a lot for a human operator to process. So that's why we need the, the cognitive systems to aid us in that decision-making aid. But yeah, to your point, uh, to be bottom line up front, you have to have governable, responsible AI that is um, protected, right, at a fundamental level. And when we integrate into the war fighting scheme, we have to make sure that the level at which we integrate cognitive systems doesn't override um, the responsibilities of a human operator and it just provides a decision advantage or as an aid, right? Supplements, it does not take over. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question, please. Um, hello, my name is Dana. Um, I have a question for Elena. I'm also a CSIA major. Uh, you mentioned that in AI in warfare is used for cyber attacks and uh, they're more my question is, are you more focused on like defense or offense cyber? And which one of the two should we focus more um, for the future or could like make stronger? Um, so when it comes to warfare, cyber attacks um, can happen both terms. You can use, well, you can, you need to make sure your systems are protected as well as many adversaries will attack you. Um, so, sorry, could you just repeat the second part of the question again? Uh, um, if they're like, what can we like focus on more in like the future? Like how we can like make it more stronger for like either uh, defense or offense? I think it depends on really what your country wants to focus on. I think in many ways that it's important to focus on both aspects. You need to have a strong defense to have a strong offense as well as a strong offense to have a strong defense. So I think in reality you want to have, you need to focus on both aspects. Although if your country is more prone to attack, then it might be necessary to really focus on the attacks. However, um, you don't want to be the one getting attacked. So again, really honing in on defense is also important. Thank you. Um, my question is for Second Lieutenant Williams. Um, with our military being more um, Reliant on artificial intelligence and robotics, what training or new technologies will our military need to use to be better defended from electromagnetic warfare since we're more reliant on technologies that are um, weak against it? So, so just to clarify, you're asking um, what training do we have at our disposal to make or, sure that... Well, I'm asking if our military is going to be more using it in the future, like weapons that are a week to me, electromagnet pulses, or like you said, lasers or stuff. Um, what would we be doing to make sure that we're better defended or able to combat these 
offensive weapons. Right. Excellent question. So that that brings up a key point, right? So as we move into this more sophisticated age of, of warfare, and we're you know introducing some of these new technologies, um, AI and, and, and spectrum operations, uh, you have to we have to understand the the place that we're at in terms of our superiority in these these regions. Um, <clears throat> And, and to be frank, our superiority is evaporating and eroding at a very quick place, a uh, very quick pace. Um, our key adversaries, being the, uh, the the Chinese nation and the Russians, have have outdone us in these fields. When the last five years, in terms of investment on and training and research and actually developing operational systems, so to make sure that our systems that we're developing in this realm uh, remain safe and uh, verifiable for our own usage. Um, <clears throat> We have to make sure there's a couple components. One, we have to make sure that our warfighters are properly trained and actually understand the impact of the spectrum and how it correlates to their operational duties in the field of battle, right? So we have to make sure we have to bring awareness like this, make sure our, our operators are aware of what the spectrum is, right? And two, we have to coordinate and, and essentially codify some, some, some plans in the background to ensure that these systems don't fall in to enemy hands. And, and that's more of a technical question in terms of how do we secure uh, components of our electromagnetic operational space, right? That's electronic protect regions. Um, and what that, that looks like, we can, a couple of things, we can do spoofing, we can uh, do a radar jamming, we can deny the enemy's usage of the spectrum. Therein, they have no ability to touch us when we conduct spectrum operations to make sure that we maintain a freedom of maneuver and access in that realm. Um, so to make sure our, our our defenses are up, we have to make sure that we deny the enemy's at, the enemy's ability to access the spectrum. That's the first step, second step. So first one, make sure our warfighters are properly trained on the spectrum and how it affects their uh, battlefield capabilities. And second step is making sure that we continue to deny the enemy's ability to access the spectrum. And as long as we deny their ability to access the spectrum, we maintain a safety for our systems. We maintain security in that realm as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, off to my right here. Hello, everybody. Cadet Cranston, class 2023. Thanks to all the students for providing this awesome research. Uh, really inspiring for everybody in here. But my question is mainly for Elena, but any of the panelists can pop in here. Um, you talk a lot about the accidents that can happen with AI. And considering that it's kind of independent to human error in a way, who I was curious if any your experts that you talked to commented on who gets held accountable when these accidents happen, whether it be in the military, um, US law, where, who's being accountable for the accidents that occur, um, and how does, what are the legal implications of that, both on the US and what NATO is coming up with in the future? Yeah, so that gets very much into ethical dilemma, and although I did some research on the ethics behind it, I did not fully um, dive into it. However, I do know, specifically NATO speaking, um, they've been trying and trying to pass certain regulations specifically on laws, which is lethal autonomous weapons, and there's really a, a stalemate in the, like, where they're going with it. Not much, from my perspective, at least from what I understand, not much has come out that really allows us to put blame in where we're supposed to put it. Same with even here in America when it comes to a lot of the incidents that happen with Tesla, um, there's not, they kind of deflect the blame, um, saying that they just need to do more training in their systems, but it's, in reality, most people don't bring it to court because Tesla, you know, probably finds a way to influence them not to, but if it was brought to court, there's many implications that really haven't been decided yet. Thank you, that's very interesting. Yes, sir. My question is for Second Lieutenant Williams. I was wondering, based on your research, you've developed a curriculum for a certificate. Is there a plan to um, implement that curriculum here at Norwich? And if so, what does the timeline for that look like? So, <clears throat> in short, yes, there is a plan to implement that curriculum here at Norwich University. I've been I've been coordinating with uh, the Peace and War Center and uh, Norwich University Applied Research Institutes um, to get the groundwork up on integrating that curriculum. But where we run into, in terms of timeline issues, where we have to wait on um, D 
DOD and, and NATO counterparts, right? So I work in the, um, I work as the attache in the uh, chief information office, where I work for one of the directors of Spectrum Enterprise and Policy, right? And I'm on a uh, allied and coalition partners working group. So, you know, the, the problem is when we're, this, this whole thing just got stood up in 2019, right? So 2019 was when the electromagnetic spectrum uh, cross-function team was established, and then we completed the study in 2021, and then we've been moving forward since then with building out an educational framework, right? So we've got, we've identified the competency models, we understand where the gaps are in, the, in, in, in training and proficiency within our warfighters, but now comes our hard work, like you said, which is building out that curriculum and coordination um, with our NATO partners, right? So we're going through that process um, of essentially uh, collecting all the curriculum managers within the individual services, and then actually mapping out curriculum between you know, the Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Army, and then coordinating and codifying that curriculum um, with our NATO partners within the respective branches and fields. And then within that, once we put that together, um, once the uh, we put that together within the DoD uh, working group, and then we'll sign off on it, then we'll be able to push that out to academia and industry. So the timeline for that's looking about six to nine months, right? Uh, and we're about month two in that. So I would say stay tuned. Hopefully before I graduate, I can speak more on the matter. But right now the hard work begins. I, essentially, I just read and, and write on it all, all day. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. No problem. Or it's students helping to design their own curriculum. Outstanding. <laughs> oh, I think that's outstanding. Absolutely. Mr. Bassett, please. Good afternoon. Uh, this question is primarily for Mr. Dewey on your research regarding uh, the creation of echo chambers. Uh, you noted the utilization of AI in a both a positive and negative way that echo chambers can be a negative outcome of, uh, the cr or AI can be utilized in a negative outcome of creating echo chambers, which is, has a detrimental effect on society. However, has your research ever taken a look at the foreign influence uh, in essentially create artificially supporting or creating uh, echo chambers that may lead to increased political polarization. Um, the most commonly prevalent example of this is uh, Russian influence in say the 2016 or 2020 election and creating echo chambers on uh, Trump's election and how he lost the election. Um, and could you provide, if your research has, could you provide any form of recommendations for say some future politicians in the room here uh, regarding what policy can be implemented to help combat that artificial uh, tampering, not only through increased education and knowledge of the individual's agency, but also what the government can do to step in and intervene. Right, so I think because of the nature of how they come about, um, and as I had stated, uh, the fact that they come from um, a place that, you know, the internet where you, shouldn't necessarily censor it to a certain degree or try to control how people use the internet because that will lead to civil unrest. For example, uh, North Korea is very well known for that. I don't think there's a great way to combat it from a government perspective. Uh, I believe that with the right education, there wouldn't be a need for that. If the general population could be able to look at information and decide whether or not on their own that it's coming from a reputable source or decide to research further um, against the point that they're reading versus researching further to support the point they're reading. Um, I also believe that it comes down a lot to companies because it's companies like Google and Facebook, um, for example, that instill these algorithms into use and, and implement them um, into society to try to make a change versus a government. I believe that um, if the way the algorithm works was changed to a certain degree, maybe uh, I, regarding specifically politics, it could have a really positive influence on, on uh, elections. But uh, no, I don't believe that uh, governments should have a, I guess, a, a stand or an opinion when it comes to, I don't think they should be able to influence how people use the internet or, um, yeah, what, what people see. And obviously, uh, my research does say that they do it in a negative way, um, but at the same time, yeah, the only way to really combat that is to better education surrounding the subject. And it is a very new thing, you know, it's, it's even the research on it usually doesn't date back past 2016, so 
um, I think we're still very early into it and hopefully uh, as it becomes more apparent to people and uh, as people who are more affected by it start to realize it, um, we'll see, a, um, I guess, an improvement. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one or two more questions and we have one or two more people, so go ahead. Good afternoon. My question is in re or regard to Mr. Williams' presentation. Um, we've seen, as per the other presentations, that AI and automated technology has been increasingly integrated into armed forces around the world. Uh, as this integration continues, do you foresee um, EM jamming and overloading weaponry uh, at some point overtaking conventional weaponry? in terms of importance on the battlefield? These are, these are excellent questions. I'm deep in thought right now. Um, <clears throat> do I foresee, it's talking about like electromagnetic weapons, essentially. Correct. Like EM jamming, EM pulses, laser beams, you know, the whole, the whole thing. Um, I don't think there'll be a point in time where they um, overtake the usage of conventional weapons, right? Uh, conventional weapons have a certain place in, in, in the multi-domain operational environment, right? They, you know, missiles are very effective at destroy, destroying buildings and destroying hard, tar tar hard targets, things that are tangible, things that we can see, right? Um, they're also very effective at people making people disappear. These are things, hard targets, tangible, right? Um, but what I would say, and caveat that, I'd say that uh, as we move forward into the future, the number of targets that aren't necessarily uh, tangible will increase, right? Um, so we may enter an era where electromagnetic weapons may be of greater importance than they are today, but I never believe that they'll overtake conventional weapons, I think. Uh, maneuvering in the electromagnetic spectrum and utilizing those weapons to our advantage are meant to circumnavigate conventional weapons, right, to a certain degree. But that doesn't take away the, the importance of, of conventional weapons. They still remain king, you know, top of the top of the deck. But um, electromagnetic weapon in the future may be able to, um, well, it does now. They're able to disable conventional weapons, right? I'm talking about, you know, uh, missile tracking systems, right? Infrared, infrared navigation systems within missile systems, right? Um, an electromagnetic weapon can, can make that go away, can disable it, right? So render them crippled, essentially, right? Um, so they're, they're meant to circumnavigate and, and, and render conventional weapons somewhat less effective, right? But that doesn't take away the importance of a conventional weapon on the battlefield. It serves a very specific purpose, and that purpose will remain as long as we have physical hard targets. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our last question will be from our first questioner. I don't think I got your name the first time. Uh, my name is Annalise Hughes. Uh, my second question is directed more towards Elena for AI and forensics. Um, I know that in your presentation, you kind of mentioned that AI relies on having like validated and tested methods, but you also kind of mentioned the Tesla incident, um, expressing that AI has this unpredictable aspect to it. Um, so there must be like a significant challenge finding these methods and tests for all these like unpredictable outcomes, even with code. So my question for you is, um, what do you believe is stunting the AI forensics field growth? Would you say it's a lack of in-depth research and security when it comes to figuring out these outcomes and possibilities, even with code? Or do you think it's a lack of interest in people or something else? Um, thank you, that's a great question. Um, to start off, um, I just want to clarify, um, digital forensics has the like needed theories, including the Daubert standard. AI forensics really hasn't gotten there yet, but hopefully one day it will be at the point where it will be, we will have the tools needed to have forensically sound evidence. Um, however, I do think it's a lack of both, as you mentioned. Um, there's definitely a lot of people interested in artificial intelligence as a whole, but there's not a lot of people specifically thinking about the failures that might and will occur when AI it gets used so heavily as it is today and will continue to be used. 
So I think one, there is a lack of interest in the field and I also do believe with the issues that are already occurring, including unexplainable AI, it, it is hard to get there. And I think people are scared because of how hard this task might be to take on, but just because something's hard doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. So I think because of the AI issues and also because of a certain lack of interest, yeah, this is um, kind of a hard field to tackle, but I do think it's necessary. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for your excellent questions. Um, it's at this point that I'd like to ask one more round of applause for these stellar students. If you have anything on your mind, I'm sure the students would be willing to engage in some discussion afterward. Apart from that, I thank you for your attendance today. Have a wonderful afternoon.